All right, let's try this again. Um, I don't know, it's it's all new. As you can see, I'm clearly not used to doing this a lot. Um, but anyway, let's see if we can start talking about this. These books we have here. All right, I think All yeah. right. <laughs> you managed to do it. All right, cool. Uh, <laughs> after some technical difficulties, we've managed to get uh, where we need to be. Um, so I don't know, everyone following along, welcome. I hope you guys are um, going to enjoy the little discussion that we have here. Um, as some of you may know, and I can see some of my students are in here. Great job, guys turning up on a Sunday evening to watch me talk about something you don't want to hear. Uh, anyway, um, I'm Alka, so I run the Hellenist History account. Uh, I do, I have the website, I do other stuff as well. Um, and a few months ago, we started the Hellenistic History Book Club. Um, we've had a few meetings so far, and um, I'm joined here by Will, who I will let introduce himself. Might be a better idea. Hi, I'm Will. Uh, I'm a history teacher as well um, from the U.S. Um, yeah, so I joined the, uh, I, I saw the Hellenistic um, Book Club and I decided to, to join it. And so far, it's been really awesome. I've, I've loved the books we've read so far. Um, and yeah, just happy to be a part of this. Yeah. And so we thought as um, the Discord is like a nice thing and it's a good thing to have discussions on, it um, might just be fun to, to give you guys a little update about what we've done so far, which books we've read, what we thought about them, and um, see what you guys think, because this might just be a bit nicer to just have some interaction with other people, because otherwise it's just a few people talking about the books and stuff, and I don't know. Mm. Um, let me just start by showing you the two books that we have read. Uh, the first one was this one. It is The Making of a King um, by Robin Waterfield, and it details the life of Antigonus Gennatus, a lovely Macedonian king um, who ruled in the third century. And uh, the other one we have read was by Adrian Goldsworthy, and it um, details the life of Philip and Alexander and their conquests, because it is called Kings and Conqu Conquerors. So, um, uh, well, it's up to you. Which one would you like to start with? So I think I think maybe we should start with, um, you know, we'll start with Philip and Alexander. I think that's more a little bit more fresh. I think we have, we have I think we have more to talk about with Philip, and, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if anyone at home has read this one before. Feel free to just comment it or leave a comment in the comment section. Um, otherwise, we are just going to get going um so this book yeah. is about philip and alexander which i mean not a lot of people need an introduction to them i think but what the whole setup of this book is that uh, the author adrian goldsworthy has tried to um, combine philip and alexander's life and show how a small insignificance if i may call it like that kingdom um like macedon was able to um defeat the persian empire and in the span of 72 years become one of the biggest kingdoms um, there were. Um, yeah, we will be answering a few questions from uh, about Alexander the Great uh, later on, but first let's just delve into the book a little bit. And it might be good because I've been talking a lot now uh, to get your impressions. What did you, what was the book about? What did you find interesting? And um, yeah, we'll go from there. Yeah, so I would say some larger takeaways is, first of all, I do like that he combined Alexander and Philip's story. Um, uh, I really like this because anytime that we learn about any type of historical figure, you know, you always focus on like the, they're kind of their famous years, right? right? Whatever, whatever that is, whoever that is. But I think everything that happens prior to that is what leads them to make the decisions that they make. So I think when you, uh, when trying to understand Alexander the Great, I think you need to understand Philip because he's such a driving force in everything that Alexander does. I think one of the points that um, Goldsworthy kind of makes is, is that Alexander in many ways, although he, he wants to break away from his father's shadow, he does a lot of the same things. He just goes like one step further, right? You know, he, you know, Philip 
sacks Rhodes, Alexander practically destroys it. You know, Philip sends soldiers into into Persian ter- territory. Alexander conquers Persia. You know, he's always trying to like one up his father. And of course, there's going to be no way to prove this, but I'd like to think that a lot of what Alexander does is him trying to to kind of be better than Philip, right? Because Alexander really inherits his his army, right? So he had to earn the respect of those soldiers, right? A lot of those soldiers fought with Philip. Um, and when you look at, you know, you kind of made that point before, uh, Macedonia's history, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty insignificant prior to Philip, right? They're, it's very divided, right? Uh, lots of kingdoms in, in upper Macedon and, and lower is really very weak. You know, so prior to Philip, I mean, it's not very noteworthy. So Philip is really like the first, first kind of notable Macedonian that probably, you know, really enters the world stage. So I think Alexander really wanted to push beyond that. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult to like uh, come out of the shadow of such a big uh, king he was at that moment. And it's just um, a very interesting point that you make that there, uh, indeed, he everything he seems to be doing, he wants to do better than his father. Um, and you see that also if you, I had that image, if you look at Alexander's conquests and the way they are described in the book, um, which is very lengthy. Um, I, personally, I found it a bit difficult to get through at points because that is not where my interests lie. Um, I don't know the people who are following along if they agree or not, but it is a bit, um, it, it's a bit difficult to get through at some points. Uh, Anyway, what was I saying now? Yeah, it, it, he wants to get out of his father's shadow. And that is one of the main motivations, I think, for him to, to make these conquests and to, to, to be such an uh, overachiever in, uh, in many ways. Um, but yeah, it's, you can see also after he's done conquering the Persian Empire, uh, you would think, okay, it's enough. But you see that there's a for me, there's a little bit of an evolution in the spirit of Alexander and the way he looks at um, as, at, at his kingdoms and at his um, his, his dr- drive for conquest, um, which is um, just quite very interesting, the way that uh, this is described in the book and the way that if you read the sources, that it keeps on going. Um, yeah, and you you brought up two points that I like. First of all, yes, the the battle, the chapters on the battles were very almost very tedious, right? Because Goldsworthy is like he's like a military stratagem, so he likes he likes to really get into like, you know, really like the nitty gritty of how battles are won, you know, and that sort of thing. And when you're reading, it's very hard to see because you know he's telling you the formations and all of that, and and it's a little bit tough to to kind of like imagine that. Um, so that was definitely one of the, one of uh, the cr- cr- critiques that I had with the book. Um, but also, you kind of talked about after he conquers Persia. Uh, I think that there is, that's kind of one of the more important parts of Alexander's life. And I think Goldsworthy highlight, highlights it really well. Is first, he talks about how, like, a lot of times, because we see it in hindsight, we kind of see it as, like, the end of his life, right? But obviously, he never saw it that way. You know, he was young. He probably assumed he had, you know, 40 more years of, you know, life ahead of him. So we like to see it as being like summative, like kind of like, oh, this is the end. This is the final chapter kind of thing. But it's really not, you know. And I think uh, one of the parts of the books that I really liked was his part when he talked about kind of when when, when they decide to leave India, right, and go home. A lot of people like to kind of create this image of Alexander who's who's uh, kind of drunk with power and and he's been, you know, He's been poisoned by, you know, Persian kings and that sort of thing, you know, thinking himself a god. But in a lot of ways, him turning around um, kind of shows how true to Macedon he was, right? Like this idea that the soldiers didn't really mutiny. Like there's really no like actual like, you know, fighting going on. They just say like, we want to go home. We want to celebrate all our, uh, you know, our victories and that sort of thing. And Alexander listens to them. If if anything, that's, you know, when you're looking at like the Greek process and, you know, and especially Macedonia in, in general, that's like the most Macedonian thing they could do, right? Because Goldsworthy kind of compares it to like the Roman princeps, right? The idea that, you know, it's a first citizen among, you know, among equals, that sort of thing. And I think Alexander never loses that. So I think it was an interesting perspective to me to think like, because I always in my head saw him as in the end, they're kind of becoming, you know, the god and not really, uh, not really sticking to who he was in the beginning being corrupted by all his power but real when you look at it that way it's 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 not that way he seems to be true to who he was 
Yeah, very true. Um, and I think that you've, you've mentioned quite a few interesting points, this whole idea of him being the um, primus inter pares, as they uh, often say. Um, you you can clearly see that um, he keeps that, uh, when he deals with his, his uh, troops, that, that element stays in. Um, what I do think is very interesting is, um, and apparently I have to leave my hair alone, so thanks for that comment, um, yeah. is um, that it's just extremely well described. So I did say before that the battles were very tedious. I have to do, uh, I have to mention that uh, Goldsworthy does deserve credit because he is very good at describing, even though they're not that interesting to me. He did a very good job in just giving us an idea of what it feels like to be a soldier under Alexander and to um, just figure out what, how these huge areas of, of land were conquered and, and, and how he deals with revolts that are coming. Think about the Sogdian revolt, the unexpected um, rebellion that he faces that is much bigger than, than he expected. Um, it's just an interesting um, way that he is able to describe them. So in a way, I think one of the most tedious bits of the book is also one of the, his strengths because he, he does make it very engaging to read, even though it is very, very, very long, a very big part of the book. Yeah, and, and kind of just going off of that, like too, he, he really pulls from so many sources. And obviously, I've kind of read before, I read it at a, at a book of, uh, about Aurelian, like a really small emperor uh, in Rome. He, uh, the, the author kind of said it was actually very easy to write about him because there's only like one source about this guy. So there's no conflicting sources. Goldsworthy, on the other hand, has so many sources to pull from throughout, you know, uh, late antiquity and into the, uh, into the Middle Ages that it, it's very hard to sift through that and create a good understanding um, of that. You know, so I think that was a big thing that he kind of organized his sources and, and created a coherent story when you do have a lot of conflicting you do have. And we had talked about before kind of have you, you have these different perspectives, uh, perspectives as well, depending on when these historians are writing about him. Right. Like Plutarch is, you know, he grows up in, in the Roman Empire, obviously writing more to the to the Romans than to probably the, you know, Hellenistic Greeks and that sort of thing. Yeah, that is true. Um, he, the thing is, like, the book is good. He does describe a lot of things very well, um, like the Battle of Dogamela, which someone has asked information about quite a few times, um, is very well written. So if you want to find out more, I suggest reading the book itself, because it is a very good um, battle. It's the decisive battle against between Alexander and Darius, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah. It After that, it kind of... Um, it just Darius keeps is pretty on. much running right after that. Yeah. Um, and it's just it it, it, it oh, I forgot I lost my train of thought here for a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so what he does well, he writes it really well. All the things are really well written, but the problem is for me that um, because he's so well versed in Roman history, because uh, in the meantime mm -hmm. I've started reading a few of his Roman books, they are yes. so well done. It is just, he's kind of giving us an, a an comprehensive overview. The bit about Philip is very interesting. But then when you get to Alexander, it's, again, the same story. There's nothing new. So you get yeah. the, back, the big uh, conquest. You get all of these ideas. And the fact that he's trying to be so cautious, as you said before, he's not really picking a side. So you, yes. you get this whole idea of, okay, if we, we have... Um, this, this huge battle, this huge figure, and then it stops. It, there's, if, if there are multiple sources and multiple stories, um, he, he doesn't really make a judgment. And in the end, he goes on to say, like, judgment is for, um, for the individual reader to make. Well, I feel like as an author, you're allowed to make a judgment yourself. You're allowed to, to take a stand and to, um, you know, pick an idea, what you think is more believable or, you know, yeah. Um, oh, I had, a, I had a good point there. I, I think I've just lost my point too. Um, what I was going to say, oh God, what was it? 
think of I, it. I just had it, and then I, and then I you know, uh, a classic yeah. like historian. There's, a, there's like a question, uh, Alexander, was he poisoned or died by natural causes? Uh, we don't really know. The more, most of the sources say he was poisoned, but then modern, modern scholars have put this idea forward that he, um, he died of like an illness. So I don't know. And I can't remember right now what Goldsworthy actually mentions about the death of him. Yeah, so I mean, it's one of those things too that it's very tough, like, uh, especially, you know, when you're looking at any ancients, you know, there's always, if they die abruptly or they die younger than they should, there's always that kind of that question of like, oh, were they poisoned, that sort of thing. Uh, and, I, and I think Goldsworthy kind of put it towards like, it's up to you to decide that because realistically, Alexander, by the time of his death, first of all, he was a heavy drinker. He didn't take care of himself very well. Um, he probably wouldn't have been eating that great anyway. Um, he had a lot of different uh, illnesses. I mean, I mean, he had, oh, not illnesses, excuse me, wounds. I mean, uh, several really uh, very bad wounds that could have killed him. I mean, he might have just drank some water that gave him, you know, malaria and he died. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like at that point, anything could have killed the guy. Um, the reason that I would veer away from poison is because anyone close enough to him to really poison him i don't think really benefits as you kind of see if you look into after alexander dies it leads to a lot of warfare and a lot of problems for most of his generals and anybody who would want to take over so i i personally don't see any motivation in killing him you know he had no air it was just going to be a power vacuum and cause problems which i mean it leads to I mean, almost 40, 50 years of, of warfare when you really look at it caused by his death. Um, I, I would believe he, it was probably just, you know, some type of illness he picked up on his way back from, from India, something like that. Obviously, you know, it, it could have been, it could have been a chronic illness, that sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, it, who knows? Uh, it's just an interesting kind of um, thing to think about. Um, I, I, do think that it's an interesting point as well. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why we always think about Alexander as this, oh, this young, very interesting man who made such great achievements because this whole idea of um, he was young when he died. And if you compare him to his father, he by the time, okay, he was only 45 when he was assassinated, but he had uh, only one eye. He had um, problems with his knees. Yeah, he had a lamp. Yeah, he was, yeah. Uh, so, you know, this this whole idea of, oh, Alexander is such a great man. Uh, he did such great things. Yes. But, um, and that's something that Goldsworthy also does well. He also gives us like the negative aspects. Um, and he doesn't gloss over or make him the he conquering hero who liberates all of the uh, local uh, peoples from, you know, from this Persian overlord. Uh, no, he, he did do terrible things. He killed his general Parmenio and um, his entire family. He killed another trustworthy um, ally. Um, and if you read Arian, which I think is an interesting source that Goldsworthy has used a lot. Um, yeah, he, he's heavy with Arian, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't read the um, very nice version that someone mentioned in the comments, but I will pick it up. I think that's a very nice suggestion. Mm -hmm. Uh, to read that again um but this whole idea of alexander as a huge conquering hero and his old man who just you know gave him his start um is something that this book does really well it actually gives us a whole um other idea of philip and philip's contribution to to, mm -hmm. to alexander's legacy absolutely um, and I actually, I remember my point that I wanted to say before. So I've, you know, I've read a few books on Alexander and a lot of times they're very in the extremes. Either he's this like awesome conquering great guy or he's like this genocidal maniac. And um, I think Goldsworthy kind of rides the, the middle ground with that, you know, kind of just saying that he's, he's a young man and he's impulsive and he makes good decisions and he's calculated, but he also sometimes loses his nerve. You know, you look at things like Tyre, I mean, he, pretty much like annihilates the entire island, you know, that's, wasn't great to do, you know, uh, and especially we see like, when you when he gets into India, he gets very impatient, because, you know, uh, you just have all these tribes, and it just becomes like this fighting the next tribe fighting the next tribe, and it's taking up too much time. And we can see that he, um, he, he, get, he loses his patience, and he just starts killing a lot. Uh, a lot of innocent people. He he he's not as suave as he was 
in the earlier parts of the campaign. So you can see he is, he's definitely human and he's making, he makes human error, you know, especially in the times when he gets hurt and stuff like that. It's a lot of his own impulsiveness, I think. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, uh, you make a very good point there, uh, which I think is just important for people to, to keep in mind when they're, when they're thinking about Alexander and thinking about the whole, um, you know, idea that is going on there. Um, <laughs> someone, no, we don't know where his tomb is. Um, mm -hmm. That is unfortunately some things that are, are lost in history. Sometimes I'm just going to uh, go back to the questions people are asking. Yeah. If it's not about apples, some people keep talking about apples, whatever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Alexander's tomb, it's funny. I almost hope they never find it because I feel like just the mystique behind the tomb is greater than ever what we could find. You know what I mean? Um, I think that a lot of people go into history and go into archaeology because they have that imagination of like this grandiose tomb full of gold and, and whatever, you know, and, uh, you know, um, and I think if we found it, it probably wouldn't live up to that hype. Um, I, th I feel like it would probably be a little bit plain. I mean, when you look at what we think is either Philip the Third's or even Philip the Second's tomb, um, it's really not that, you know, it's cool, but it's, it's not as big as our imaginations will ever make these out to be. So I feel like if, if it was found, it probably, and you know, it could have been found and we just don't even realize it's him. Um, if I had to take a guess, I feel like it's under the streets of Alexandria somewhere. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that would be my guess. Yeah, that would be the most logical um, suggestion there. I mean, if it has been found apparently by a uh, Lara Croft and Tomb Raider, I think, uh, at some yeah. um, which to me seems, I was watching and I was like, okay, uh, sure. Um, but yeah, Alexandria would be the best guess because that is the last known uh, evidence we have of it being there. Um, what yeah it's it's always interesting to see how how much this is shrouded in mystery and um yeah alexander's tomb and his death are always going to be interesting to people who who don't know about him uh, or who know mm -hmm. about him intrigued by him um in a lot of ways i feel like his death immortalized him a little bit because you know if he let's say he did live to 65 70 years old it's more likely that he would have had more blunders in his career that would have made him look less like a god, you know? I think one of the things that's so wild about Alexander the Great is that he, he kind of enters the stage and in like 10 years changes the face of the world, right? Um, and if he was around for longer, you know, he, he would have, I think his next move would have been, maybe been like Carthage or something like that, one of those like other stronger Mediterranean civilizations. Um, especially because the Phoenicians, you know, obviously at Tyre, put, you know, are a sore spot for him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I feel like he would have probably had some more blunders throughout his uh, his career if he would have lived long enough. And it wouldn't have been as cool, you know, as just, you know, a clean 12, 10, 12 years of conquering. It's 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 quick, but it's it's so uh, awe inspiring. Yeah, it really is. And I think it's just um, an interesting way to, to think about what he would do next and how how um how to, to see how big of an impact he still has thousands of years later uh, but i think a lot of people keep forgetting that he was able to do what he did because of the first steps that his dad um did and that's mm -hmm. why this this thing is um a good contribution to the work that's already out there on Alexander, which is a lot. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I really like kind of that point because, again, one of the biggest things for him is his army, right? And that's really Philip's army. Their training, you know, the siege equipment they use, the Cerisas, all of that, that's, that's all Philip, right? So in a lot of ways, he builds the foundation for Alexander. He does. And uh, I think that is um, a brilliant way of um, of thinking about how um, how Alexander's legacy has actually starts way before him and way before um, before all of the actions that he does. Um, do you think there's any truth to that story of Julius Caesar seeing Alexander's stat statue in Spain and crying at the foot of the statue? <laughs> What do you think? 
I, I I don't think it's absurd. I will admit, though, anything that's, that's to do with Julius Caesar largely comes from uh, his, his adopted son, Caesar Augustus, or like Octavian. And mm -hmm. Octavian, in a lot of ways, is like a propaganda machine. You know, he really, really uses his 40 years like to shape everything, you know, to his liking. And this, you know, this whole idea of like comparing Caesar and Alexander, obviously Plutarch does. So connecting their story in some way is always, you know, I don't think it's impossible, but with with how much of Caesar's life is kind of like inflated by, you know, historians and also by, you know, Octavian and all that. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it happened, but it could have. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you there. I think it's a nice, um, it's a nice romantic thought. It's the same as um, Alexander going to, um, going to Troy and uh, mm -hmm. standing at, um, the site and then making an, an offering to, um, to one of the gods as a, as a way of remembering Achilles um, and portrayed mm -hmm. there as the modern Achilles is you know it's it's a nice idea it's always a, a fun way a fun thing to talk about in class and to um to say like oh look we think that this and this and this happened same with Nero setting fire to Rome mm -hmm. um yeah it tends to be very very careful when people use this as an example of how bad an emperor he was but it's it is just a very interesting um interesting fact that these things keep on on living uh in, in in history and people keep on mentioning those i also think it's important also to see kind of like the bigger picture there like one of the greatest things that i think alexander gives us is his legacy because how many conquerors and how many generals and how many you know important politicians kind of want to be like alexander alexander is the first one to really try to like conquer the world right and he, he sets this bar that so many people, I mean, look, Napoleon uh, conquered Egypt because he wanted to be like Alexander. He wanted to go to Egypt. You know what I mean? That's, that's only 200 plus years ago, you know? So uh, up until recent times, Alexander becomes like the poster boy, you know, kind of this, this picture of like, this is what it means to be an awesome general, you know? Um, and I think Caesar, you know, regardless of that story being real, uh, true or not true, you know, Caesar was, you know, he was a rather, came from a rather prominent family and he would have been educated on the campaigns of Alexander and he would have been inspired by them. So in a lot of ways, you could really say that, you know, Caesar and what he will do, you know, in Gaul and all that, I'm sure he felt like Alexander in Persia, you know, and that sort of thing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, they always, I feel like a lot of these great um, Roman generals and these great, um, you know, figures that came after Alexander in a way were trying to recreate his empire and recreate his um, his his achievements, as you said. Um, but that's also interesting to see that how quickly he um, he amassed it and how quickly he marched from Macedon all the way to India and um, afterwards died. Uh, how quickly after his death it all fell apart. So and yeah. you can clearly see, as you said before, these forty years of, of strife between who is actually now going to um you know follow him and uh you know coming up with uh you know who's actually going to be his follower uh, and his heir um that created a whole lot of issues and it's just an interesting fact fact for my interest actually starts after he dies um mm -hmm. if I'm, alexander never appealed to me that much it was only the whole turmoil and the fact that he you know died without actually properly thinking about what lays what lies ahead um and not being confronted by his own mortality because that's what i found very what i always find very yeah. interesting about alexander he's always this idea of oh i will i'm young i will live forever um yeah. he never if he, if he was smart he would have started well he, if he was smart he definitely was smart otherwise he wouldn't be yeah. able to conquer yeah <laughs> yeah uh just this whole idea of okay this this guy you have one son he's very young you just die you're gonna you might just die at a very young age have a contingency plan the fact that he did not have that is you know interesting but then again you can't blame him i'm very curious and he never even mentions it either really or at least the sources like he never really even thinks about 
the future, you know, in, in regards to after his death and that sort of thing, you know. Um, and obviously, Alexander's sexuality is always something that's like kind of thrown up in the air as well. But he doesn't seem to be even very interested in, in having kids and that sort of thing. And it could have just been because he's on campaign. He's really so kind of pushed, you know, uh, he's just trying to push forward. Maybe he thought he had more time um, and that sort of thing. And we see it, too, that there's countless times where he he's in battle and he's, you know, uh, there's a story when he like he jumps I think it's in India where he jumps over the the wall into the fortress you know and he's by himself for you know and that's when he gets you know his lung punctured and that sort of thing so I think that's a level of carelessness maybe a level of thinking that he is a god you know I think because he accomplished so much maybe he really started to believe his own what he was saying you know that he was you know the son of Zeus and that sort of thing it's it's also tough because a lot of that you know you never know when those sort of things come up if he even believed that no that's very true um and it's just an interesting uh I, th I think the whole idea of son of Zeus is really the the ploy of uh, okay I need I need a way into Egypt um mm -hmm. and, you know it's it's just an, an interesting um aspect of how can you get uh, what is the ideal strategy to just get into uh, Egypt and to position yourself as the legitimate ruler we see him during this time and time again when he goes into Persia he um, after his first first defeat of the Persian Empire or the Persian army he um, installs a um, satrap and then he keeps on using these um, Persian customs which is uh, an interesting and very legitimate way for him to just keep on you know going and keep on consolidating his rule and consolidating his empire what i just find very interesting still is that he just didn't think about what happens after he's done conquering and that's mm -hmm. what led to a huge um problem yeah i think you you made a good point there i think one of the biggest things that if i had to say like the genius of alexander is his geopolitics the fact that you know he he doesn't just take over and say, you know, these are, you know, Macedonian rules. These are Macedonian customs. Get used to it. He blends it. He he respects other other cultures. You know, he goes to Egypt. He becomes a pharaoh. Right. You know, and and obviously it probably was a little convenient when he's trying to be a god to be a pharaoh. But uh, the fact that he you know, his name is in hieroglyphs. Right. Like the fact that he uh, when he when he conquers Persia, he picks up Persian customs, you know, there are the stories, you know, that when he meets with Persians, you know, he he greets them in the Persian way. And when he talks to Macedonians, he greets them in the Macedonian ways, things like that. Um, and obviously, this gave him a lot of criticism with probably uh, with his soldiers and closer, you know, confidants and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, one of the biggest problems with conquerors, is if you look like look at some of them, you look at like Genghis Khan, he does really good conquering, but he doesn't consolidate. He doesn't he doesn't create uniformity. And that's why these empires don't last. I think if Alexander would have been a little bit clearer with an heir and that sort of thing, I think his empire could have lasted much longer than it did. Yeah, definitely. Um, and it would have changed the way that everything happens afterwards and the Hellenistic period would be completely different. Um, and I always try to imagine how would the Greeks eventually you know, come out of this, you know, the, the city states that, that were still um, in existence and that, that rebelled against Alexander uh, and his, uh, and his father. Um, yeah, it would be an interesting, you know, um, alternative history. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's always curious to see, because obviously, if, if the, if his empire didn't collapse, you know, if, if it wasn't, you know, kind of cut up by the, uh, the successors after, it's it's curious. We had talked about this before, kind of how Rome would have been kind of influenced by that, because something that I think allowed Rome to blossom, you know, is the fact that they they could, you know, they they really wipe up all of that empire, obviously, a little bit later. But I think their ability to is the fact that it, it was divided. Uh, I think if Alexander kept that size and, and he had more of the Argeads lasted longer, um, you might not have Rome. And it's like, you wonder how that would have changed and evolved, you know, Europe in general and, and Asia and Africa. Yeah, it's always the, um, you know, the what if question. It's always mm -hmm. a um, way to think about, you know, how did, what would happen if and if and if and if. And it's an interesting um, exercise. 
that I don't know if you do that with your students. I sometimes um, do that as well to get, just give them an idea of what would change. And yeah, we can put a lot of ifs oh, in yeah. history, but that is the most fun part about history for me. I think it's just imagining what could have been different and how one watershed moment might just change everything. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, it, it's always my biggest thing, especially with Alexander, is what he would have done if he didn't die is where he would have yeah. gone. You know, I think Plutarch summarized it. He said he just never would have stopped conquering. Like he never, he would have never been happy, you know, and I, mm. I would believe that, you know, that he would have kept pushing and pushing until he physically wasn't able to. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, that's a good way of, um, of, of looking at it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to to say about the book uh, or about Alexander or Philip in general. Uh, and no, I don't think his tomb could be in Babylon. Um, I'm not sure, but I wouldn't say that that is a very um, valid point. As to the thing, I, I, yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, yeah, I was just gonna, I feel like it almost definitely has got to be in Egypt, you know, like the last time you hear of it is when Ptolemy, you know, famously steals it from Perdiccas, you know, which is like, so cool. Like one of the, I think one of the best stories, you know, uh, especially after his death. Um, and obviously, it's brought to um, what city it wasn't brought to Alexandria, Alexandria first, it was brought to it was brought to Memphis. And, you know, they, most people think we found this one tomb from Nectanebo, one of the later pharaohs. They think that it was put there for a little bit until um, Ptolemy was able to build the mausoleum that he housed um, Alexander in. Uh, the reason I also think it's there is because one of the major uh, things Argyads would do, one of the customs was the, the king would bury the previous king. That was like kind of a rite of passage as a king. So Ptolemy wanted to bury Alexander in Egypt with him because that kind of gave him legitimacy to rule. Um, and I, I think we have records of it being up there until I think Emperor Hadrian, I think in the 130s AD, I think is the last, he's the last that visited that I know of. Is that story that Augustus touched his face and broke his nose off apparently, but yeah uh yeah i think that there's like a mention of like in 400 when um chrysostom tried to is in alexandria um by then it's it's gone um so mm. somewhere in between the end of the second and the beginning of the fifth century the, the tomb yeah. has disappeared um yeah there's also a lot of natural disasters that had hit alexandria as well so you know it could be right in the harbor you know <laughs> in, under the yeah. water that that is an interesting harbor the fact that it's like it, it, it yeah it was built in specific instances i'm um, actually i went to an exhibition about alexandria a few weeks ago very interesting um mm -hmm. but yeah they they also make a big spiel about alexander and how um he, he changed everything and has changed everything which is true but it's uh, yeah it, it's just interesting to see how it still plays such a big 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 role uh and then you also have like the alexander romance i don't know if you know a lot about that but yeah, the whole idea of uh, these extroverted um things that are added such as the uh virgin birth as someone mentioned oh, yeah. yeah that that is an interesting um an extremely weird uh, tradition that i've tried to get into but it just it, i don't know for me it, it's too it's too out there yeah uh so yeah um i think for me if i would have to kind of recommend this one I'd say really I can recommend it because it is a very well written book it is a huge thing to get through uh, and some passages will make you want to stop yeah yeah just flat out because it is so lengthy and so very know, dense very dense at times. yeah dense and dry in some places very yeah. very dry um but I would suggest give it a read um, if you are interested and if you like uh, Adrian Gold, Goldsworthy's books. Um, but it is a very long, very thoroughly read or research read. Um, so I could, would recommend it. But if you are interested in getting a um, shorter, more less comprehensive intro into Alexander, I wouldn't start with this one, I would find a different one um, that might just give you 
tits bits that you want to know because this one is you know i would say if you if you want to read this one you should have some like prerequisites to it you should really understand alexander's life already yeah and you should be really into um battles and yeah um, you know yeah that was it for me i mean that was in general the whole thing that i i thought was was valid about this about this book it was interesting mm -hmm. just yeah. gave me it tested my perseverance in places oh yes absolutely the battles really were were very drawn out in that book yeah exactly i don't know if anyone else has any questions or anything before we move on to this one um which is a little bit more my wheelhouse um but i do see that yeah sam indeed if i can if yes yeah, sam um it is true we do admire alexander um because of what his legacy and what all of his conquests mean for us i can't see the question it's just not updating on mine so what was the question if you uh just Question is, uh, or the comment is, uh, we admire uh, the West, admire Alexander, and said not to admire the campaigns of Dario, Darius and Xerxes. Do you think the East would feel similar about Alexander and his campaigns as we do for, um, as we do for Xerxes? Okay, so it's, uh, I, I feel like it's all empire games. You know, I, I don't look at Alexander as being good or bad, just like I, I wouldn't see Xerxes or Darius as being good or bad either. I feel like their, their motivations probably are very, very much the same you know, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah no, I agree. Um, I think that we indeed admire him for our own reasons because of what he, he means for us and uh, what he did uh, introducing the Greek culture into the East. Um, but I can imagine, and I don't want to speak for anyone here um, because that is uh, not what I want to do here. But if you're from those countries, that it, it might be different. Um, and I, for one, don't know enough about the Persian uh, conquest or the Persian empire to actually fully admire all of the conquests that they had done before. Um, and to the, there's also someone who, who mentions that some historians claim Alexander was Albanian, uh, was Albanian in origin. Um, yeah, I, I tend to just not really think that just because of all of the research that I've done and all of the things that um, I know I don't think you. Yeah, and also, Tim, when you're looking at someone who's, you know, been dead for almost two and a half thousand years, I mean, like, national identity, it's, it's, it's not, we would not understand any of it, you know. Um, we call him a Greek, but, you know, if you, if, if you got to talk to him, I, he wouldn't say Greek. You know, there was no Greek na national no. identity. So no. I, I think that's also, like, it's just... We we put like our modern construct, I you know, to these people, but he wouldn't have any of had any of you know, any understanding of that anyway. No, that's the whole thing. That identity is very um, it depends on 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 you know so many different things. Mm -hmm. Um, but in in general, El the modern construct of identity, as you said before, the ones that we know, Albanian, uh, Greek, Illyrian, um, European, Belgian. American, it's something different that you cannot really project into the past. It's just, and yeah. think about that, think about it that way. Yeah, they, they don't see, especially with Alexander, it, you know, there is, there is very little uh, national identity in the same state, in the, in the way that we understand it. Yeah, because um, there was, obviously there was a difference between Greek and Macedonian at the time, mm -hmm. this different version of the Greek language. Um, but it's it's something that just it's also why he is so controversial in some regions because some of them claim the Macedonians claim them as Macedonian, the Greeks claim them as Greek, um, but it's an entirely different discussion. Which um, yeah. I'm just gonna let them have because uh, yeah. he was Macedonian, but in a sense that he was Macedonian in ancient Macedon. So that is completely different than the modern modern countries that are there today. Um, but yeah. I don't know if you want to add anything onto that. Otherwise, I would suggest we segue into a different book. Um, Absolutely, I'm down to uh, move to Antigonus. Cool. So yeah, so we've uh, we've already mentioned that this one, uh, Alexander has done so much for uh, Macedonian and for Greek history as well. Uh, but the problem with him is when he dies, he has no he leaves no heir. It leaves a huge gap for. Um, 
other his you know other p figures to come in his mother tries to usurp his throne his half brother tries to do so several of his generals try to do so and you know at, at the end of the um road there are a few kingdoms that emerge and one of them is the antigonid kingdom who now uh, who actually ruled in macedon and the most important figure there is our uh, is the subject of our next book and that is written by Robin Waterfield it's actually the first book we've done mm -hmm. we did that uh, I think back in September so I've tried to reread parts of it but it has been a while so uh, sorry yeah. <laughs> to the to most of you um, if we are not as on point as we were with the other one because that has just been a few weeks this has been a few months anyway uh, what is this one about it's basically a book that has been written by Robin Waterfield. It's part of an unintended trilogy, as he himself mentioned it. Um, he's talked about this book in the Hellenistic Age podcast, which is um, very well done. It's a very good podcast, and it's an interesting episode to listen to if you want to um, find out more about the author and why he wrote the book. You have to read the book. Um, but... In a sense, this is a, is a history of the third century BC, and the author has divided the book into two parts. One part is the general um, history of the third century BC. For us, it's a useful one because a lot of the we don't actually have any authors like Polybius or um, his predecessor who write a comprehensive history of the period. What we do have is a lot of epigraphical, numismatic, and archaeological evidence, um, and Robin Waterfield has tried to give us a good overview of this third century BC by using Antigonus as a sort of stepping stone into the broader history. So the first part gives us the whole historical background of the third century BC. And the last five chapters delve more into Antigonus and his, you know, his life and the people he interacts with and how he sees things. Um, yeah. So I really like this book. I really like Robin Waterfield. He manages to write history um, that is a bit more niche and to write it so that anyone can use it, even if you're um, not as, how do I say this, not as familiar with this whole period or the Hellenistic, the, as I would say, the deeper Hellenistic um, history. Um, and even if you are like me, you know a lot about it already. This is still a very good and very fun read. Um, I don't know. What did you think about it, Will? Yeah. So uh, first of all, I, like, I, I really like for, I commend him for picking Gennadis as a topic. Obviously, you know, we went from Alexander, who has like dozens of sources, to Gennadis, who like has like once, br like just briefly mentioned, uh, you know, if that. Um, but yeah, so first of all, like you had mentioned before, he has these three books out. I think he has, his first is about the wars of the successors, I believe. Then he has this one on Gennadis, and his third is about uh, the Macedonian uh, wars with Rome. Um, so he picks very, like, hole-in-the-wall topics, which, again, uh, I give him a lot of credit because it's just his job is just way harder to write this than any you know, than most topics. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting because uh, I've I've read books on Antigonus the One-Eyed, his grandfather, and I recently actually read a book on Demetrius, his father, and and these figures are pretty, very interesting guys. And Gennadis, uh, I think his youth must have been so um, so crazy because his father, I mean, his father is the besieger, right? His father, you know, is the reason for the Colossus of Rhodes and all of that. Uh, so he probably would have, you know, he grew up in this very turbulent time for the world i mean really for the world uh he was young for it but uh he was a lot I, do you know what year he was born roughly i i, I don't recall uh Gennadis? yeah i think it was um oh crap if i'm not mistaken two I'm gonna... oh, i wrote it down I'm somewhere like 95 if i was gonna yeah try. i think maybe even sooner um... yeah it might have been yeah uh, I wrote this down somewhere. Um, give me one second. I'm look it up. Yeah. He reigned from 277, so he had to be sooner. Uh, 320. Yeah. Oh, wow. 320. Yeah, he was born around wow. BBC and he died in 239 BC. So he wow. was 
an old man when he dies. Yeah, he, he's like one of the few successors that actually like made it beyond 50, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's really incredible because just to think that he's born in like the, only a few years after Alexander dies and he's born into this world of like Ptolemy fighting Antigonus and Seleuc, you know, Seleucus and uh, all the other guys, like Symmachus, all of them. So he grows up in this, in this like, this world of, of like war. I mean, a lot of ways you could justify that the first world war happens at this time because it really is the whole world that's fighting. So, I mean, I know that his father, you know, Demetrius was, was in prison for, for a good portion of his 20s. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So Gennadis probably saw like the harsher parts of life and, and uh first like i said before i think it's just amazing that he wrote about him because most people would never take on Gennadis because there's so little about him so uh, i would say that was the first that was what i liked about it is that it was such a you know hole in the wall topic i had mentioned this to you before the one thing that i didn't like about it was that when you read the book obviously the first chapter or two are just kind of going into the wars of the successors and the context behind Gennadis's life um and he uses waterfield uses a lot of like um I, he kind of creates like historical reasoning so kind of like saying well we don't really know what Gennadis was doing at this time but you know most people at this time would be doing this and mm -hmm. it's nice and it's and you need to do that to create a good understanding but I found a lot of the book is his his creative you know historical reasoning um and you know that's just fancy way of saying like guessing you know so yeah. when you're reading it it's you know it's interesting but a lot of it comes down to being just this guy's, you know, guess on what Gennadis was doing at this time, not necessarily what he actually was doing. So that would be my only criticism of it, that I felt some of the book, it was more bread and lacked, like, the meat, you know? Um, but again, what can you do? There's, like, probably next to no really formal sources on Gennadis. He's probably, he's, he draws more from the time periods and kind of inserts Gennadis into what we know of the time periods. Um, I really found interesting the relationship between Gennadis and Ptolemy II. Okay. Um, I found that to be uh, very cool. And even with Ptolemy I as well, Gennadis, you know, would have been alive for a lot of Ptolemy I. And the Antigonids uh, obviously fought Ptolemy at several, several times through the, 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 the early, I guess you say late 300s and uh, early 300s, to late 200s uh, BC. Um, so I, I just, I can imagine with all of that happening, all of the life lessons that Antigonus was getting from his father, Demetrius, you know, when hearing about all these things and, and the concern that Philo would have felt for him and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is interesting that you mentioned that because for me, you know, because my like love and my specialty and my interest always goes out to like uh, Hellenistic Peloponnese, Hellenistic Greeks. Um, so my focus point point was more his relationship with the Greeks and um, you know because at that time as um, some of you may know I've done a podcast or two about this if you uh, feel interested check it out anyway and um, we have this whole federalism and the federal states how uh, they came into being and his description of it even though it's fairly general it's a good way for people to just realize that um, and I found this very particular about the Hellenic period as well if you look at the Greeks, people tend to forget that, um, you know, this, they're no longer the center of power. They, uh, everything else is on a much higher level. And what I think that Waterfield does really well and uh, makes very easily understandable to those people um, reading the book is the way that this, these kings, these new, um, you know, these, um, these new players have to deal with these traditional Greek city-states, some of which still think that they're um, all that, or they're the hot stuff, but they're not, um, because they, 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 you know, they're no longer the focus of, of, of the culture and the focus of, of new things. Um, and that is also one of the key themes of the book, which for me is the reason why I, I love this one. And I also have this other one taken at the flood and the Roman conquest one um, is, the way he's easily managed to just see in which these Greek city-states, these traditional players interact with um, these new kings and how, how you know, their relationship shifts. Um, you see, and uh, Gonatas has, at the beginning, everything goes well, but his the fact that he, he, he tries to reshape Macedon as well um, in a way that um, he's, after a period of, 
you know, instability and then troubles. He tries to make it a sort of new federal state with himself at the top, um, which clearly he got from looking at these, these Greek federal cities. But the problem is he overestimates his, um, his, relationship, with, his relationship with some of them by yeah. relying on the garrisons, which poses a big problem. That seems to be his big, biggest criticism, too, is, is the military control over a lot of these areas. And I feel like he, he's a bit different from his father and his grandfather in that regard, because when you look at um, Antigonus the One-Eyed and Demetrius, they're almost looked at as like heroes to the Greeks, like the liberators in lots of ways, um, especially for places like Athens. Like they, you know, and even, even Rhodes, like they have these statues of them because they, they see them as, as liberators from the tradition, you know, the, and they gave the ability to have democracy again and things like that. And I feel like by the time of Gennadis, he doesn't seem to like even try to hold up that veil anymore. Like even the veil of like some form of democracy, he's more like, all right, we're just, we're past that, you know? Yeah, no, it's very true. Um, which it's, it's just an interesting thing that um, he, you know, these, these Greeks, especially the whole focus still on Sparta and Athens. Yeah. They're necessary fixtures, but if you know a little bit more about the Hellenistic period, you know that both of them are past their prime. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's necessary to just um, focus on them. I just don't know if he had to have a whole chapter on Sparta. Um, I, but... I do recall that actually he did go very much into like Sparta and, and he went even, I think a little bit further back than Gunnatus too. He kind of just summarizes Sparta from like the Peloponnesian Wars up into that point And it's, it was interesting for me, though, because that's like I'm more into the Roman history. So uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes. So if I'm if I'm talking about Sparta, I'm probably talking about, you know, the Persian Wars or the or the Peloponnesian Wars, you know, something like that. So this was cool because I it's uh, kind of seeing seeing it after that. You know, it's something that I had never really thought of or, or thought about. Um, but, yeah, I kind of agree with you that he he dives. He, he dives a lot into that. And it's very interesting, too with Athens, because I find that with all Hellenistic leaders going from Philip up into Alexander and all of the successors, Athens always like has this like very, mis like, he always gets a respect, I find from all of them, you know, when these guys will absolutely conquer all of these places and, and will, will punish city states for way less, like Athens can revolt all the time. And it's like, they, they seem to always kind of just like, forgive i guess you could say they they don't they don't you know go in and really destroy it or anything like that so it's always cool to see that i guess they appreciated athens golden age and and saw it as this you know academic center and that sort of thing yeah i mean you you get this alexander does the same thing so athens revolves philip does the same thing if you look at the other book it comes back a few times um they just never tend to punish them uh, or punish mm -hmm. their leaders. um which is interesting because, you know, even Rome never does that. Um, Rome always mm -hmm. kind of finds a way of excluding them. And when the Achaeans then, um, you know, try to um, make the same mistake, they end up being punished immediately. And um, yeah, Athens just apparently seems to keep its prestige, even though it's in no way the the city it was before um but with sparta mm -hmm. I think it, it's necessary for him to go back a little bit to explain some of the um, issues that are going mm -hmm. on later. So the crisis of um you know the fugitives and and um troubles that are, are coming later on um for me what i found a little bit um sad is that he didn't spend more time on the um greek city state I guess that's just because I'm a little bit obsessed with them, or I used to be a little bit obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I just really, um, I think that that you know is just a a good way of getting into it. Um, but yeah, I I like this book a little bit more than the other one, just because for me it's 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 also a bit shorter. Um, but it it just it doesn't focus on the um, how do I say this the um, The... I, I wouldn't consider this like a traditional biography, you know, no. uh, if you're looking for something that's going to go from like, okay, from his birth to his death, it's not quite that, right? We just don't have enough on him. 
So it's almost just pulling the events around each aspect of his life and kind of what he would be doing and how he reacted to it with what we have. So I guess that would be the thing that I found to be a little bit tougher with the book is it's, I like a more traditional biography, you know, uh, this, I feel like, and it's only because we just don't have the sourcing, you know, to, to create that kind of understanding. But a lot of it is talking about things that are happening around Antigonus and not necessarily what he was doing with it. Yeah. I mean, if you want to solve that problem, there's always, I don't know if you've read Tarn's biography of Antigonus Gnathus. It is mm. from exactly 100 years ago. Um, yeah. But it feels a little bit dated in some ways, of course, because there is so many, um, <laughs> so many new um, source material that has been discovered. Mm -hmm. But then we're talking about ep epigraphical or numismatical and stuff like that. Um, but I, I might suggest you you pick that one up because that is um, f very short, of course, because we don't have that much yeah. <laughs> source material. But uh, he does very. It's a very seminal and very in important um, important work. Um, but yeah, this was in the traditional biography, which is why I think I like it so much. Um, but then again, I don't know. I also like this other book, Taken at the Flood, uh, which, you know, is also a very, um, very good one to me. I haven't read the first one, um, but I am going to get into it. Um, so yeah, Antigonus Ganatis. Um, I don't know. I really really liked it have you read any other books about Antigonus Gennatus or anything similar uh not on Gennatus uh, again so I you know my main focus is usually more either Roman Republic or Roman Imperial I've only yeah. as of more in the last year or so got into more um Greek history um and I will say I do find more interesting uh his father, you know, I, I'm more into either Demetrius or Antigonus one. I, I like the wars of the successors, the, you know, from let's say 323 to like, you know, 285 BC. Yeah. That's if I, when we're talking Hellenistic, that's, that's my favorite uh, topic. And why? I think it's just, it's so, it's, I mean, I don't know how they haven't created like a movie or shows about it. You know, I, I think it's like when you read some of these stories, especially like, let's say immediately after Alexander's death, I mean, it gets violent, you know, in weeks, you know, weeks after his death. I mean, he wasn't even buried and, and you know, they already were fighting. And from right off the bat, I find that uh, it's very interesting, especially Ptolemy, right? Because Ptolemy's like this very kind of He's kind of in the background uh, when you're looking at Alexander's companions, right? His, you know, when you look at, you know, uh, Perdiccas, Antipater, um, Lysimachus, Antigonus, all these guys, he, Ptolemy's not mentioned that much, you know, he's kind of a background figure, but that almost works in his favor, right? Like w when after Alexander dies, he, he pretty much moves right. To, he goes right to Egypt, right? He knows the benefit of this, this the, the wealth there, the fact that all these natural um, barriers are around him to keep him protected. You know, he can see an army coming, you know, miles away. Uh, and he just plays it so right. He just does so well with it. While all these, I always like to see him as this cunning guy that while all the other successes are, you know, fighting and that sort of thing and arguing, Ptolemy's sitting calculating, you know, he's waiting to see, you know, what to do. And, he plays it just so well, you know, he makes, he really doesn't make many mistakes for, you know, in the, in the, the 20 years after Alexander's death, he just so well too. And he establishes one of the longest reigning dynasties of any of the successors, you know? Yeah. I think he, he was the last, uh, his dynasty is the last one to exist. Yeah. I mean, the period ends with, ends uh, because I, I always, I think that this whole ending of the Hellenic period within 31 BC, um, mm -hmm. Cleopatra. You know, and other people do different dates, but yeah, Cleopatra and her um, last stand against um, Augustus is, you know, the end of an of a Hellenistic kingdom in the Hellenistic period, in in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, Ptolemy is, yeah, he's just a very clever dude, as you said before. He uh, mm -hmm. he knows how to play it and how um, how to go um, about it. I don't have. You know, I haven't had many, um, I haven't read that many books about him or the things I know I've forgotten, um, which is why I'm happy that our next book will focus a little bit more on um, 
on you know that part of the um, you know of the Hellenistic world but yeah. it is it's not about Ptolemy though it's about uh, the Hellenistic women for a yep. change I don't know I yeah I have you been reading have you gotten far into it or? yeah i'm about halfway i think about like 100 pages in, i'd say i mean it's a very short book and it's like 170 pages or something like that um uh if, if we're getting into it now i would say i am I'm, I'm okay about the book uh i think it's a little bit dry and and i feel like some points i'm reading and i'm like what am i what am i taking away from this you know yeah. Um, but it is interesting because there's, there's been just, I think, perspectives that we don't see in history, right? Because it is very male dominated. You know, when we look at when you when, you know, outside of Cleopatra, you know, when, when are you talking that much about women in these worlds, especially it does get a little bit more into um, analyzing some papyri and things like that of, of uh, the average women in these countries. And I think it creates a different it, it's one of the things that I've gotten from the book so far is like we like to see the similarities between us and, and ancients and things like that. But then also you see how far, you know, we are from, from the viewpoints that they had, you know? Yeah, very true. But I just like that, you know, the, the way that these different sort of groups come into focus and you can see that it's not just, you know, the, the Queens and, and everything that's mentioned and, and people like Polybius, who just tends to, um, to focus on, you know, the big, the big hit, the history mm -hmm. of the big, um, but here, they've tried to um, give a voice to the, you know, to different layers of different groups, and yet it is quite dry in some senses. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm, yeah, I read it for the first time ten years ago. I'm, I'm now about fifty pages in. Um, yeah, it's 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 just it's nothing revolutionary. Um, mm -hmm. It is in, it's, yeah, for me, it's just a fun a fun book. Um, yeah, I don't know, I. This one is still my favorite, but you know, that that is just me. Um, if you had to pick this one or this one. You know, I'm gonna go with, with the Philip Alexander. I loved the Philip part of the book. I yeah. really did. I thought, you know, cause most of my understandings of Philip has have come from like reading a Hellenistic book and getting a background with Philip or, you know, reading the preface with Philip or something. So this was the for first time that I really like looked at Philip's whole life kind of written out. And when you read it, you're like, wow, like he, he really reformed and in such, in pretty quick, uh, obviously it wasn't like 12 years like Alexander, but still in a matter of like, what would you say, 25 years, you know, he, he takes what this, you know, this backwaters of Greece really and turns it into an incredibly strong power, you know? Um, yes, it, it did take me a while to actually get through the book at points because just some of it was just, you know, dry. But the parts that were good were very good. Uh, yeah. I've read a few of Goldsworthy, uh, Goldsworthy's books, obviously, because I love Rome. So he's he's a little bit more a leader in that. So I respect him more for those. But yeah, I think I would go with, with Philip. Yeah, oh, that's perfectly valid. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think we've um, we've done a very good job at, at trying to you know bring these two uh mm -hmm. and lift them up again which might be difficult but still i'm gonna try yeah. uh <laughs> bring justice to these two and um to just have a good uh, idea of give people a good idea of what we tend to just discuss in these little meetings uh, that we have um and you know i don't know if you want to add anything or have a comment or anything to add otherwise i think um, for me, I've, I've gotten a lot of, out of this today. Um, don't know about you, if there's anything you want to add. No, just honestly that I, I really enjoy doing this. I think it's been uh, really great so far. You know, I strongly encourage anybody that's watching this to kind of join in on it. Um, this has been a really awesome experience. Um, I'm learning obviously a lot about people that I wouldn't have reached out to, to learn about, you know, otherwise. So this has been a nice, like, getting me to read books that I normally wouldn't have read, you know. I might have went more traditionally to something Roman. So this is getting me out of my comfort zone, you know, which is obviously good getting used to learn other um, other, other areas and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, no, I, overall, I really love doing this. Yeah, I'm, I'm having really a good time just like seeing what other people think. Actually, just getting back into books that I either have read or uh, I've wanted to read for a very long time. Um, and, you know, the next one after this Hellenist Women, I think we said we were going to delve into Dolomy. Or Tony the Second. 
Oh, uh, yeah, no, I think we, we had a few ideas, right? We had, I think, Ptolemy, there was a book on Ptolemy uh, that reads very similar to the Gennadis book, very kind of like same kind of flow. You know, we had that Athens after empire, which is kind of following, you know, Athens after the golden age, right? From their, you know, their fall from grace, that sort of thing, which is another really cool one. I think it goes up to, it goes up to Hadrian too. So yeah. it's, it's very interesting to me because I'm curious, I've never really thought of that, how Athens kind of looked, you know, into the, ADs, you know what I mean? That sort of thing. Yeah, no, that's right. I actually uh, recently downloaded it to uh, for my students to use because we're going to Athens in May. Uh, and they have one of some of them have uh, an assignment that they have to present bits on the Hadrian's Arch and, and Roman Athens. Mm -hmm. I completely forgot that we had said that we uh, we, we might do that one as well. Um, yeah. No. Um, for anyone still looking about i would suggest you follow will's account it's um i'm gonna try and pronounce this not with a very belgian pronunciation but ah. it's uh, <laughs> Orbis sine fine, uh with like little um underscores in between um and yeah, just give him a follow it's very interesting content as well um just head on to the website if you want to find out more reviews join us on discord and um yeah anything else just send me a message or anything um and I'm happy to discuss any questions, topics, comments you have. Uh, otherwise, I would say I'm going to now enjoy the rest of my evening because it's already almost 10 o'clock here and I still have to find food somehow. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank you again, Will, for just doing this with me. And I think we should Thanks do this when Absolutely. we have to read the next one. Um, Absolutely. To any members of the book club who are out there and who've um, joined in today, um, I'm going to try and see if I can put this on um, the Instagram page. If I manage to figure out how to do this, I'm sure I, it will give me that option. Um, but yeah, check back with us soon. And um, I would say enjoy the rest of your evening, day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Perfect. See you soon. Thank you. See you later. Right. Bye.